privilege of introducing our presenter. But before that, I would really like to know who our audience is, because that's what they always teach in college, isn't it? When you get up to public speak, who's your audience? Not very well to uh, Denise Leon Bratton. If you are not familiar with her, you should be. If you don't know about the Career Center, you should. <laughs> they have a great staff. They, they are just willing to be available to you at all, at any time, and will help you through career choices and looking at majors, et cetera, et cetera. No reason not to go, really good service. And one of the leaders of that service is who's going to present today. So thank you, Denise, for being thank here Thank you, Ellen. And we're looking forward to it. Okay, so how are we all doing after lunch? Are we doing well? Thank you for being here. So a little background about me. As Ellen said, I am one of the career counselors and assistant professor here at GCC. I have been in the career counseling business for 15 years. I worked for the University of Southern California as a career counselor for six years. I have my own private practice, and I work here at GCC. So I have a lot of experience. I've worked with every single employer you could think of. I have worked with them. Every single person who's recruited a college student, I've worked with them from Disney, to Deloitte & Touche, to Bank of America, to Wells Fargo, to IBM, to Google. I've had the privilege and opportunity to work with the people who are going to hire you. And so I put this uh, basic resume workshop together for you. How many of you have written a resume before? OK, so let's see if what you learned from me is in addition to what you already know, are we going to take your resume apart? And that's fine too, OK? So I'm going to give you all the basics of what uh, employers look for and my recommendation to you and this is how the Career Center works. We ask that you attend one of our workshops. This is one of our workshops and then you may schedule yourself for a one-hour appointment with myself or one of the other four members of our staff to have your resume individually critiqued. Okay and we're going to talk about having different resumes. So myself I have four working resumes. I have a community college counseling resume I have a K-12 resume because I used to work in K-12. I have a private practice resume and I have a four-year university resume. So you, shouldn't, you should have more than one resume. The problem I find is a lot of people, they apply, let's say you apply for 20 jobs and they send the same resume over and over again. They don't tailor their resume for the position. And then they come and see me and say, how come I never get interviewed? And I'm like, how many resumes do you have? How many times have you changed What's on there? Oh, I have a generic. Um, well, that's why you're not getting an interview. A generic in this job market isn't going to get you hired. You have to, as Ellen said, this is your advertisement, your calling card. We don't know you. How are we going to interview you? Based on what's on the piece of paper. And it's very impersonal. Because I'm going to look at this piece of paper and I'm going to decide whether you're worthy of me bringing you in or doing a phone interview with you. And that's going to make or break you. That's going to get you the job or not get the job. So we're going to talk about all the foundation. Yes, ma'am. That's okay. Uh, I was wondering, you meant that if you have many jobs, you shouldn't write your experience down? No, 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 no. I'm asking you if, you, if you've applied for different jobs, you shouldn't be sending the same resume over and over again without any changes. That is a no-no. So for example, let's say, what's your major? Okay. Well, let's say you were a business major. Okay. And let's say you were applying for accounting internships. And let's say you're going to apply to 10 different companies. And what I'm saying is you can't just send the same accounting resume for the first company to all 10. You're going to make tweaks and changes and tailor your resume for each of those 10 companies. Because even though they're quote unquote accounting internships, they write their job descriptions a bit differently. They want to know how your attention to detail is. So if you're the person like, I'm lazy, I'm just going to send the same resume and see and roll the dice and see what happens, not a lot's going to happen. You need to tailor your resume to the different companies and the different positions. It takes work. And I'm going to show you how to tailor based on the work. That's what I mean. OK? Did that make sense? OK. So let's get started. So what is a resume, and you can make notes on this because I'm going to add some stuff that's not in here when I speak to you. So a resume is an advertisement. It's your personal brand. I don't know you. It's like if I go, let's say I see a commercial for Coke and Pepsi, and there's something about that that I like, and I go to the store and I said, hey, I remember that ad. Let me look for that new product. It's like this. You're advertising yourself. This is your brand. Your resume is your brand. What are you selling? 
all your experience, your transferable skills, the education and knowledge that you've acquired in school and on the job. That's what you're selling. So I want to see whether I'm going to buy that or not. Is that worth looking into and exploring my options of purchasing or not? An individually designed document, that's why I'm saying you've got to tailor your resume for each specific position. Don't send the same resume over and over and over again. What's going to happen? You're not going to get any results. And I guarantee you, because in my 15 years of doing this, that's how it's always been. That hasn't changed. A summary of your education, experience, accomplishments, and transferable skills. You're going to hear me talk about that buzzword a lot, about what a transferable skill is, and I'm going to explain that in here, for a particular position. It's not your whole life story. You're not going to submit me a five-page resume on everything you've done in your life. You're going to tailor that resume to why am I going to even consider interviewing you. We're going to look at what you have and see if you're a good candidate to be interviewed. Used by an employer as a screening device. We're not going to interview every person, right? Do you guys know what the average employer interviews? Out of all the resumes they get, a typical employer interviews between 5 and 15% of all the resumes they that they get. It's not in your favor, right? So if I get 100 resumes, maybe I will interview the top 10 to 15 to 20 at the most. So there's a whole 80 others that don't even get a shot with me. And that's going to be based on what I see. What I see is going to decide that. And it's only one piece of the job market puzzle, but it's the most important piece. Because if you don't have a good resume, you're not going to get an interview. And if I don't have an opportunity to see how awesome and great you are, I'm not going to hire you. right? So it's like this chain of all the stuff that goes together. And a well-written resume and properly formatted. I'm going to teach you the proper way to format. That's one of the big problems people have is the formatting and what's supposed to go in that one or two pages that you have to tell me about yourself. And it'll land you an interview. OK, so what's the most important, according to employers, what's in the first two thirds of your resume is the most important. You've got to catch their attention in their eye. So what you put in the first two thirds is going to tell me whether I want to read it, continue reading it, or nah, it doesn't really meet my needs, too generic, didn't really spend time on it, not worth my time and effort. Okay? The average employer, just like Ellen said, the average employer looks at your resume in 10 to 20 seconds and decides yes and no right then and there. Okay? And then if you are in the yes pile, they're going to look at it more carefully. If you are in the no pile, you're just a no. You're headed to the shredder or a bin of recyclables. Okay? So it's really that, that people are like shocked when they hear that, but this is coming from employers. This isn't coming from me. This is how they do things. And you want to get in that yes pile, because the yes pile gets a more thorough looking after. The no is just a no. So how much is a degree worth? You know, students always ask me this because they say, well, I'm going to go to Berkeley. And Berkeley's going to guarantee you me a job. And I'm like, Berkeley ain't going to guarantee you a job. Harvard can't guarantee you a job. Berkeley will give you a great education and knowledge, but what you do with that while you're there is up to you. They're not going to guarantee you a job. They're going to give you great resources. They're going to give you exposures to companies, to information sessions, to workshops, to great professors. But they can't guarantee you a job. So that's why a degree isn't worth as much as you think it's worth. It's worth something. It's not that a degree isn't important. It is important, right? That's why you guys are all here. You're attaining some type of, you're either transferring, you're going to get an AAAS, you're going to get a certificate, you're going to do all of the above. But a degree is only worth 50 to 60%. You know, I go to conferences every year with different employers, and I ask them the same question every year. How much is a degree worth to you out of 100%? 50 to 60%. Do I care? that the person has a degree? Absolutely. Is it enough to just have a degree? No. So you could be the 4.0 student at Berkeley, and you didn't do anything while you're in college. You never had a part-time job. You never interned. You never volunteered. You never had clubs. And are you going to get hired? No. Unless your father owns a company. But how many people's father owns a company? And that's in question, because uh, there was a whole HR process of that as well. But it's not about just being a good student. A lot of people think if I get straight A's and I go to a prestigious university that some big company is going to hire me, and that's all I need, and that's not, I'm here to wake you up, <laughs> tell you the reality of the world of work, is you need to have these type of things. Have you interned? Have you worked part or full time? Do you have work study? That's considered work. Have you volunteered? Are you involved in organizations, clubs, activities, or professional associations? That's what's got to be on your resume. And a little tip here that's not in here 
is how employers look at the resume. So when you are a junior level status, a junior in college, okay? So when you transfer from GCC, you are a junior. 60 to 70 transferable units means you are a junior. You can no longer use your high school stuff in your resume. That is a surprise to a lot of people. So you're a freshman and sophomore, while you're here at GCC, those of you who are traditional age students, right? What I'm talking about more like, you know, 17 to 24, you can use your high school stuff. But once you leave here, it is not allowable on your resume. That's why you need to get other stuff on your resume. You can't say, well, it's 16 to 18, I work part-time at the mall. Well, that's great, but by the time you leave here, that 16 to 18-year-old stuff doesn't matter to an employer. They want to know, what did you do in college? And this is what they're looking at. Can you multitask? Do you want to work? Not a paycheck. Do you really want to work for me? I'm going to pay you X amount of dollars. Are you willing to do the work for me? Because I always tell people, the cheapest thing for an employer is to fire you. The most, because there's someone waiting in the wings. The most expensive thing to an employer is to train and develop a new employee. Especially a new grad who doesn't have a lot of experience and is unproven. Because I'm going to pay you to train you, give you benefits, give you a salary, give you sick time, give you vacation, give you an office, a cubicle, whatever I'm giving you. And I hope that I make the right investment because we give you a probation period of three to six months and we hope that through the interview and resume process you work out. But if you don't work out, then I'm going to have to give you a pink slip and go collect unemployment and then I'm going to have to do the search all over again. And it's a lot of work on me to have to file again with human resources, post the job, relist, and, fi and file. So that's why I tell people it is a lot of work to hire an employer. I've been on hiring committees. It is a lot of work, the ultimate goal to get the employee that you, to do the job that you need them to do and to the best of their ability, they're trainable. But do I, am I going to stick with them or are they going to you know, not be the employee I had hoped and then I'm going to end up firing them during probation period and then hire someone else? Not a really good thing. Now the thing about a resume, why so many people have problems with this? Now my bachelor's degree is in English. So I have a bachelor's degree in English, my master's is in counseling psych. When I first learned to write a resume, I was a student at USC. And it was very difficult for me because I was telling my career counselor, wow, this is so different from what I learned in English class, right? I'm an English major. And you're taught MLA, APA format, subject, verb, adjective, agreement, complete sentences. This is the trick about a resume. It has its own writing formula. So everything you learned in English 102, English 104, English 101 is going to go out the window when I get through with you. Because the employers have a different setup of how this has to be written, and that's what's hard. You know, I work with people who have master's, PhD, and JD degrees, and they have a hard time. You know, you think lawyers, and then they start changing firms, they have a hard time writing a resume. Because this is not their usual language. They're used to writing cases and briefs that have a complete idea, thought, and research and citing. That's not how you work with the resume. It's a completely different way of writing, which I'm going to show you. Okay? So about the resumes, they do not begin with a pronoun when you're going to write your descriptions. You don't begin with a noun or a pronoun. You're going to begin with a verb. And if you look at that resume guide in front of you, pages 12 and 13, we have done the work for you. It's that uh, white packet. We have alphabetized a list of verbs that we think will be very useful and beneficial for you, which I think is really nice of us because when I was in college, my career counselor said, here is the thesaurus and the dictionary, figure it out. But we have learned and evolved that we try to make things easier for you. So these are some of the verbs and they're alphabetized for you that you're going to be using in your resume. And you're going to be starting off your descriptions with the verb, not a noun, not a pronoun, no I, you, him, she is ever going to be used in a resume, okay? They don't contain complete sentences and that's what's hard also. Resumes are not complete sentences. They don't have to have a period. They can have, they're fragments of sentences. So they can have no, they can have a period or they uh, may not have a period. The margins, so there is a set resume margin. So Microsoft, the company, when they put out Microsoft Office, they set the margin to one inch. My, now, for a resume, you may have 0.75, three-fourths of an inch, or an inch. My advice to you, get in the habit of using three-fourths of an inch. Go into open up a Microsoft document and reset the margins and have that as your resume Word document you work out of. Why? Because you're allowed that much space and you're going to need it. 
Trust me, it doesn't seem like it now, but the more ex work experience you have, the more education, the more skills and accomplishments, you're going to have to get used to that. So I always tell people, you've got to go customize the margins in your Microsoft Office or Suite or whatever you use. You need to change the margins from the default setting that the company Microsoft has made into the 0.75. It's a good habit to get into now. It will cause you a lot less grief. Now, you want to use, now this resume paper thing, so, now obviously if you're, if you are going, if the job description says submit only electronic forms of the resume, what does that mean? Only through email, okay? Don't be the smart Alex student who tries to say, I'm going to be the one that turns it in hard copy. If it tells you in the, you, the job description dictates what you're going to do. So if it doesn't say anything, you are allowed to send in your resume in hard copy or you can drop it off in person. I'm a big believer in that. I don't really like email. I think it's very mass produced. I think it's very impersonal. And the only reason I'd email my resume to a company is if a company told me absolutely no correspondence other than email, okay? So what you wanna get in the habit of investing in is this. So in case you don't know, there is such a thing called a resume paper. And what distinguishes this paper is a few things. It's made out of cotton. 100%, not wood, okay? And it comes in different colors, white, it comes in a lot of different colors. So if you are an artist, if we have any artist in here, you can do light pink, light blue, light yellow. If you're not an artist, you have no business using those colors, okay? You wanna use, my favorite actually is cream and gray, but this is a white example. And how you know it's, I'm gonna actually pass it around so you can see. Resume paper comes in two weights. It comes in 24 pound or 32 pound. 24 pound, I'll pass both around, 32 pound. Doesn't matter what you choose. What distinguishes it, and I don't know if you could see it here, is there's a watermark. Resume paper always has a watermark. And employers like this paper because it photocopies really well and it handles really well. Meaning if multiple people are handling this paper, it still looks nice and crisp. And this is what you want to invest in if you're gonna send it in or hand deliver it. Now obviously, like I said, electronic, you can't do this. My advice to submitting a resume in person or through the mail, eight and a half by 11 golden envelope, do not fold it. I have had more employers tell me how they hate to unfold your whole documentation. Attach this with a paper clip to your application and hand deliver it or send it in, but eight and a half by 11. Weigh the measurements. If you go to USPS, the government post office website, you can find out what an eight and a half by 11 envelope weighs, what the weight is for the postage. Or just go to your local post office and have them stamp it because a lot of times the date becomes very important. But I'll pass this around so you can see. And it's up to you which, which, which weight. It only comes in two weights. Some people like the light. I like the, I like the heavier weighted, but that's just my own. But this will cost you, this is about 100 pages. This will last you enough, it'll last you your lifetime probably. This will cost you about 15 bucks. You can Staples, uh, Office Max, Target even has it, Walmart even has it, any of those, Office Depot, best place, really good investment to get in the habit. Because if you think it, it doesn't matter, it does. I've had more people tell me that everything's great on the resume, it comes down to the details. Like, how much did the person do to want, how much does the person want to work for me? What are the little extra do they do? Do they just do the mass email like everyone? Are they taking the time to really work on this and show me that, hey, I'm the candidate for you because I'm going to give you 110% of who I am and what I'm about, and I'm committed to doing a good job for you. I'm not just, yes? Isn't it very important to make sure the watermark is in the right place as well? Uh, no, the watermark, they don't matter. It just distinguishes the paper from the regular oh plain of the mail pattern. Yeah, the watermark doesn't have, it's not a, they don't, that detail, they're not oh. as detailed about, but it's a good question. Okay, so let's talk about resumes, and these are the page, these pages correspond to the resume guide, because I tried to write the, res, when we wrote the resume guide, I tried to do the PowerPoint. So resumes come in three formats and three formats only. So if you heard otherwise, there's only three types of resumes in the world, and that's it. Chronological, this is what I'm gonna teach you today because that's the most common. And if you look at page 19 and 20, Alex Smith, and I forgot the other gentleman in the packet, is an example of a chronological resume. I use a chronological resume. Most people do use a, a chronological resume. And what makes it chronological is it organizes information by jobs, positions, and experiences in what's called reverse chronological order. So reverse chronological order means a resume is written from present to past. 
And that's a little different than normal because usually you think of past to present, but in a resume you've got to reverse that. And it's going to be what are you currently doing now to what you did yesterday or what you did a year ago. It's reverse chronological order. So I'm going to show you how to do that one. The second type of resume is functional. Now we give you a lot of examples of this because it's very difficult to write, but here's the catch 22. Employers don't like a functional resume typically because they don't like the way it's organized. If you look at page 21, for example, the data is organized as far as skill areas. And the reason why, and it says here, it's common for gaps of employment. So let's say you worked and you got married and had a kid and you haven't worked for five to 10 years, you're gonna see the gap. If I used a chronological resume, my first question is like, what have you been doing in that 10 year gap? That will bring the attention to the employer. You don't wanna bring that gap because that's not gonna get you an interview. So that's why they use functional, but it's a very difficult resume to write. That's why we give you four samples. And unfortunately, it's not the preferred one. I've had more employers tell me they don't like it, but we have to put it in here because we have people we work with here in a community college that fall in this category, but it's a tricky thing because I always tell them, you know, it's a tricky resume to write and, I, and it's not the preferred resume format. And so employers know what the functional is because if you notice on the, the work history goes at the bottom on a functional, we just go with skill, but we don't know how those skills were acquired because we don't want to bring the attention to the gap in employment. And then the last is the combination. And this is common for people who have combined work experience and career changing. So chronological and combination are very similar. Um, what I'm gonna show you is more chronological, but I will do some variations of combination in that. Okay, so we're clear. This is, so if anyone tells you there's tons of different types of resumes, there's not. This is it. This is the, there's only three, three alone. But I'd say almost everyone in this room will pretty much be using the first one because that's the most common. Uh, most col people, college students, that's what they all use. It's the normal one. Okay, so what do the employers look for in there? So let's get down to some of the formatting. Length, one page only unless you have seven to 10 years experience. That is the rule. So if you have seven to 10 years of work experience, you are justifiable to have a two-page resume if you wanted to. Exception is U.S. job, government job. Let's say you want to work for the Department of Agriculture. You want to work for the U.S. Department of Labor. You want to work for the U.S. Department of Forestry. Any job within the, in the U.S. government requires a two-page resume. Why? They want a lot of experience because government jobs are very secure, they're very stable, they have excellent benefits, and they pay really good, and they're very hard to get into. That's why they ask. Even of college students, they ask for a two-page resume of a 22-year-old. So I tell my students who want to go work for the US government out of college, you better have enough good stuff to fill two pages because you're not going to be looked at. Okay. Uh, formatting, do not use the resume template. You've got to create the resume in Microsoft Word. Okay, so if you, those of you who are familiar with Microsoft Office, there's a resume wizard, a resume template. I call it the kiss of death because employers dislike the formatting is wrong. Even though Microsoft gives it to you for free, when you buy Microsoft Office, do not use it. I've had more employers tell me that that goes in the trash right away because they know what it looks like. I know what it looks like too. There's too much white space. The formatting isn't correct. You've got to open up Microsoft Word. You set the margins to 0.75, top, bottom, side to side, and then you start typing, okay? So the structure. So employers are looking at how long is this resume you're submitting to them, the format, what are, are you using the correct format, the structure, okay? And do you have he the right headings, right? So headings are like education, work experience, volunteer experience, skills, activities, et cetera. That's the structure. And you will all have different combinations of those depending on how much experience you have. Okay. So as I said, you've got to start your, re when you're talking about what you're doing in your job, if you have a part-time job or you're working on a project for school or you're doing research or you have an internship, we're looking at, did you start the sentence with a verb? Okay, always have to use a verb. Does your resume meet my needs? I put out this job description, I wrote a certain way. Are you sending me some generic thing you came up with? Or are you being very specific? Because it tells me a lot about you. What tells me is, are you into details? 
How good are you with the details, the specifics, the nuts and bolts? Or are you just someone who's kind of lazy and just sends it and hopes it all works out? Because I don't want to hire someone that hopes it all works out. Because what happens is I hire you, and in my company, you hope it all works out, right? And that's my money that I'm investing in you and investing in clients and customers to make money for the company to pay you and to generate new ideas and create new things. Uh, accomplishments, transferable skills, and contributions. That's what we're looking for in a resume. What have you accomplished in school and outside of school? What kind of skills do you have? And I'll talk a little bit more about what transferable skills are. And what kinds of contributions have you made? Have you made contributions to a club? Have you been a leader of an organization? Have you made a contribution to your work? You know, you, you work in McDonald's and you're a cashier, great. What kinds of contributions are you making for the customers and the clients who come in there and purchase items from you and want to have a good, you know, experience? Font size and style. So there is preferred resume font, and it's not Arial, and it's not Courier. It's Times New Roman in Georgia. This is actually the preferred font across the board for employers. Use Times New Roman or Georgia, and you should be using 11 or 12 point, choose, you know, be consistent, and I'll explain what that means, throughout the resume. So you shouldn't have, you know, 14 all over the place, 16, that doesn't work out. Your resume's gotta be formatted into 11 or 12, and consistent, okay? And what I mean consistent, yes? Not even the name? Problem. Your name can be different, but I'll get that. That can, is the only thing that can be bigger. You're ahead of me. But yes, your name can be 14, 16, or 18. But the rest of the text has to be 11 or 12. And when I mean consistent, if all your headings are 12, education, work experience, leadership experience, are those all 12? They've got to be 12, the headings down the page. You can't have, okay, I'm going to have work experience 12, and then all of a sudden I'm going to put education in 11. Doesn't work like that. It's consistency and what it looks like. A correct spelling and verb tense. Okay, so remember this. If you're no longer working in a job, or you're no longer doing that club or activity, or you're no longer a leader, or you're no longer volunteering, you've got to use the ED form of the verb. So you have to say managed ED, assisted, helped. Really important. If you're still doing the job now, you have to use the present tense singular form of the verb, not the ING. So you're not supposed to say creating. You say create. You don't say developing. You say develop. So singular present tense, and that's very important because I see a lot of resumes and people are talking about their job currently there and they're all, I'm managing. No, you manage because this has its own jargon and the jargon is that, not the ING. So even though you're used to using ING in your papers, do not use ING in the resume when you're talking about ver using a verb and you've got to put it in past tense. So if you quit your job yesterday, what happens? Easy. Exactly. You gotta, you gotta change it up and you gotta be aware of it because those little details don't seem to matter. And I've seen, I've seen employers tell me that everything's the same and I have really good candidates. The only way to narrow is to nitpick. I'm gonna nitpick on the format. So who am I gonna interview? Because I'm not gonna interview all 30 people. I've gotta cut the list down to 20. So that's how you stand up. Uh, correct spelling, do not rely on spell check. Okay, here's my advice to you on how to read your resume. Type out your resume, print it out, read it backwards. Sounds weird, read right to left. Because your eye will do the double take and your eye will catch the mistake that spell check can. So spell check doesn't know, are you saying is or are you saying in? It's both prepositions, they're both spelled correctly, but the context may not be right, but it's a computer. It doesn't know everything. So my best advice to you is if you read it backwards, and I've done this to my own resume, you will see, your eye will do this funky thing. Read it line by line, right to left, you will see where the mistake happens grammatically. Okay. References and objective. So do not ever put references available upon request on your resume. That's a taboo, that's a bad thing. It hasn't been used, I'd say, for about 15 years. Never put those words, which I see, I will do this workshop and someone in here, hopefully not, will come in here with that on the resume. Nobody uses that. You're gonna create a reference sheet and I'll tell you what that is. And it's in your packet too, by the way. But never put references, and you really don't wanna put, oops, it says preparing to stand by. I'm not sure what's going on. Is it updating? <laughs> Uh-oh. Or is it hot? Your thing's just down. Use one. 
So back in the day, objectives used to be the norm. You know, you put objective. A lot of employers think it wastes space. So you're really not going to do an objective. Thank you. You want to write a cover letter. That's why I passed out the cover letter sheets for you. Yeah, thanks. But uh, just remember, my advice, do not you. The only reason you use an objective is because the employer told you to. OK, but you really shouldn't be using. Thank you, Zolaire. And never lie. You know, people think that people don't really call you on, what you're, on your resume, and they do. Whatever you put on your resume is open for discussion. When you get, let's say you get an interview, and you put in your resume, I'm an expert in something, and then they test you on it, you better be an expert. So I had a student of mine saying he was fluent in Spanish. And what happened? They did the interview in Spanish. And he had a very difficult time because he wasn't an expert. He was more or less conversational at best. And they stopped the interview. And the head interviewer said, why did you lie to us? And he's all, because this is an international business job and I thought it looked better. And she goes, no, it doesn't make you look better. It makes you look like a liar. And if you can lie on a resume and you can lie in an interview, what says you're not going to lie to me when you're working for me? That's the whole connection, right? Your best foot forward. Yes, Alan. Sure. Uh, about the data part. Mm -hmm. okay. um, employers now are I mm -hmm. say that don't put your address because that could actually single you out as somebody we don't want because we're all the way in La Crescenta and you live all Right, you may want to use a P.O. box or some people, I have had students do that or, but you know. But also they're asking for Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. they're Which is... Right. So do you recommend that they put that kind of thing? No. <laughs> well, the LinkedIn you can because that's a, that's a public entity. A LinkedIn, you don't need, all you need is a LinkedIn account to look at anyone's. You just can't be uh, connected to them. Right. But the Facebook, there's this whole thing in Congress that, you know, before, a few years ago, and Ellen and I have talked a lot about this, before I, uh, employers, when you were interviewing, would, uh, in the interview, they'd have a laptop there. And they'd say, please bring up your Facebook page. And actually, that's illegal now. But before, but they can ask for the LinkedIn page because you don't need to be someone's friend, or you don't. There's no privatizing of LinkedIn. You're, you know, LinkedIn is you're, It's a public entity, so anyone can look at LinkedIn. And I highly recommend you get a LinkedIn page if you don't have one, because that's for professional networking, not for social. But that's a good question, by the way. Okay, so you really want to read the job description carefully. Really look at minimum preferred and desired qualifications. You know, I've had people that they just don't read. I mean, they just don't really look you know, of what the real qualifications are. And they're like, oh, Denise, I didn't get an interview. And then I'm looking at their resume, and then they bring in the job description. I'm like, it says preferred a bachelor's degree in business or required. And you have a bachelor's degree in history. How does that work? It doesn't work. It's not the same thing. If they said any major, cool. But you see, you don't want to be the smart one. Because sometimes when you think you're that smart, people are like, oh, I don't want that. That's too much to deal with. Smart aleck ain't going to do well in my company. I want someone who's going to respect the rules and what I'm paying them to do. And they can bring new ideas, but I don't want them to rock the boat so much as another boat. OK? So you want to prepare. And you really want to use, and I get this question a lot, is you want to, when you find a job or internship you're interested in, print it out, take out a highlighter or a, a pen, and underline or highlight what are the key things about this job and how do you fit with that. That'll make, and you really want to use some of the words they use, like the exact verbs they use. Because a lot of employers do keyword searches, especially if you apply online. So everyone puts their resumes on, onto the website of the company where this job is posted. And the employer goes in and looks for keywords from their description. And those are the resumes that come to the top. Because what does it tell us? You actually read what we wanted. So that's why I'm saying you want to get in the habit of using that. OK, now the scannable resumes. If it says scannable, bullets don't scan. OK, so you, but, and don't use paragraph. One of the, my advice to you is I've had more employers tell me they hate the paragraph style of a resume. They want bullets preferred unless no scannable. Bullets, arrows, dashes, asterisks. That's what they prefer. That you list things according to, and if you look at our samples, bullets are the best unless they say do not Submit scannable resumes only. Bullets don't scan, period. They don't scan correctly. It's going to be really funky. So in that case, use dashes, arrows, or asterisks. You're going to be OK with that. You want to tailor your resume. Do not use the same one. I guarantee using the same one is not going to move you forward. It's not even going to get you in the running. It's going to be in the no. 
And the difficult thing about looking for a job or internship, it's like having another class. You know, I tell my students all the time, I teach two classes here, and I teach this in-depthly to my students who take my class. And I said, it's like you have 12 units now. This whole process is like having another three units added to your schedule. So you have 15 units now. One is all about searching because it takes time to do this. This is not overnight. You've got to write the resume, tailor it to the job, go see the career counselor, look at it, apply, and do the cover letter, create the reference sheet, then interview for the job, they get called back, then provide your, you know, it's just like, it's a whole, it's a whole bunch of stuff. And it requires time, work, and persistence, but in the end, the end result is one, it's wonderful like when my students come back to me and they tell me, oh, Denise, I applied for 20 internships and I got offered five. That is awesome. Like, then we get to choose which one do you choose and why, right? I get to help them make that decision. All right, so let's look at the, let's get into the, the meat of the resume. So these are some common headings you will have and you may not have all of them and it's okay. You don't have to have all these. But these are some examples of what a typical college student has on their resume. Education, obviously you're all gonna have education because you're here at GCC, right? So you're here pursuing something. So we know you're getting a certificate, a degree, transfer, or all of the above. Okay, so you all have that. Related coursework. This is really good for a first full-time job, entry level, or internships, okay? Related coursework is courses you've taken in your major, that are related to the internship you're trying to apply for. Honor scholarships and awards, if you've got your on the dean's list here at GCC, you have some type of scholarship, you definitely can put it in there for now, you wouldn't put it in there later, but for now it's fine. And experience, so this is the key about experience. A lot of people just give me experience, that's what they say. They give me a block of experience, that's not the best way to write it, you've got to subdivide it. The best resumes have experience subdividing into different types of categories. So you can have work experience, and I'll explain what all these are. Volunteer experience, research experience, leadership experience, relevant experience, project experience. The more you can divide your resume into these types of areas, the better off you will be, because this is what employers like. It separates the categories right away and tells me what you've been up to and what you can do. Skills, computer language and personal, and activities. Activities is if you're a member only. Like you're a member of a club, but you don't have any leadership capability other than voting, okay? Leadership experience is you're president of a club, you're treasurer, you're historian, your activities coordinator, you know, whatever you are, that's what that's gonna be. All right, so let's, I'm gonna break down now the resume, okay? So now, uh, one thing in this last slide, let me actually go back really quick. So for those of you who have a lot of experience, you won't start with education. So a typical college student starts with education. I do not start my resume with education. I start with the summary. So adult reentry students, if you have a lot of work experience, even though you don't have a degree, my advice is to begin the resume with a summary or profile because your work experience will justify you just need the degree. But for traditional college students, education is going to be the first thing because you don't have any work experience to tell me to, uh, well, how are you going to summarize you know, four years of college? I mean, I'm looking for a summary is usually three years or more of full-time work experience, basically. All right, so the header. So let's get down to the, the structure. So your header will go at the top of your page, and it's going to include your name, address, phone, email, zip, et cetera. Now, if you look at the sample, the re sample resumes, look at page 19, for example. Alex Smith is an example of a space saver header. Okay, so you may write headers, and this is up to you how you structure this, in two, three, four, or five line headers. The more experience you have, the more your header should be less lines because it's gonna take up too much space, okay? So you can, uh, the more experience you have, the more you will shrink your resume header from five lines to two or three lines. I myself have, well, I change it up. Sometimes I use a two-line header, sometimes I use a three, because I have a two-page resume. But you want to get, and there's examples in page 19 through 26 of different styles of headers, okay? But uh, Alex Smith is an example of two, now, you can either center that header, you can move it all to the left-hand side, that is style points, that's totally up to you, okay? That's stylistic. But what should be included is very important. Okay, so I kind of broke this down as best as easily as I could for you. Your name has to be bolded. And your name has to be 14, 16, or 18. Cannot be 12, it doesn't stand out. 
cannot be regular, can't be italicized. It's got to be bold because that's what an employer looks for. Okay. Now, underneath your name will go your address. Okay. Your address is unbolded and no italics, just plain Georgia Times New Roman font. Your address needs to include your city, state, zip. Your phone number is in there. You don't have to write cell. You don't have to write mobile. You don't have to write the word work. If you have multiple numbers, then just give me M for mobile, W for work, and H for home if you want to do it. But don't write out the whole. It takes up too much space. Okay. Email. I want your email address. Have an appropriate email address. A lot of people think that their email is really cute. It's not cute to employers. Okay, I've seen some crazy email addresses, some nicknames, some slang. Just doesn't work. If I have to email you and I look at that and think, holy, what is this? Get yourself a free Gmail account with your first name, last name, first initial. Just get a simple email that you actually check. And do not write the word email. It's understood. Everybody has an email address. You don't have to tell me email, colon, da, da, da. I don't care. Just a waste of words. Okay. Understood? This is your header. So this is what's got to go in there. Only the name is bolded. The name is 14, 16, or 18. The rest of your address, your phone, your email, 12 points. Do it in 12, not 11, so it stands out. Okay? So that's, what, that's what's called a header. Your header is always the contact information that you have. And whatever style you choose, two, three, four, five line. I like to get students into the two or three line because what happens is once you graduate from the four year, you're going to have a two or three line. I've never had a four-year student have a five-line, because that tells me you didn't do anything in college. The five-line's too much wasted space. So education. And like I said, so this is for traditional college students. Your education will go underneath your contact information. But if you have a lot of work experience, you're an adult re-entry to us, you're going to have a summary first. Your education will go either at the bottom or secondary. So what has to be included in education? Now, you see the word education is all caps with a colon and underline? That's stylistic to you as well. That's stylistic points. You just have to be consistent. So if all your headers are capped, underlined with a colon, then all of them have to be like that. It's up to you. you can, but you have to bold it. You can do uppercase, lowercase, underline, no underline, semicolon, no colon. Just be consistent. That's stylistic, and we allow you to do whatever you want. You're going to have the name of the college. So the name of the college always goes first. So here at Glendale Community College, Glendale, California. You have to reiterate the city name, even if the city name is in the title of the college you go to. So even if you say Cal State University Northridge, you have to say Northridge, California after. And if you look at page 19, you can kind of see uh, with Alex on how he's formulating the education. Okay. And under that will go, what are you majoring in? So what's your major? Are you transferring? Are you getting an AA, AS degree, a certificate, all of the above? You have to list that in the education, under the word education. And one of the key things, one of the things employers really dislike is people like to give a date range, meaning they'll say, I started GCC in 2011, September, and I'm going to whenever. They don't want that. They want to know, when are you leaving us? That's all they care about. So uh, the example here I have is expected transfer June 2013. So when are you transferring out? That's all you tell me. I don't care when you started GCC. I don't care how long it's taking you at GCC. I care about when are you getting your degree or transferring or graduating. That's all I care about. So you have to put the word expected, but don't give me the range you've been here. So you could be here for five years for all I care. I care about when are you leaving. And some people are because some people have to work. I mean, I have students. I have. One of my students, she's a single mom with three kids, she can, and she works full time, and she can only take one or two, and that's, you know, that's fine. I told her, no problem. You, know, you have a valid reason of why you cannot come full time. But when do you expect to have, when will you be done, and that's what you need to put on your resume. So when are you expected to transfer, graduate? So don't do the date range. It's a really bad thing. Just give us the approximate, and just guess. Maybe you think you're going to transfer next year, and it, you, know, you couldn't get all your classes. Or something happened and you had to take a leave of absence. That's OK. So change the thing. It's not, you're not set in stone. They just want an approximation. OK? GPA. So for those, now you can put GPA on your resume. And I do suggest you do, but only if it's 3.0 or higher. 
So anything lower than a 3.0 shouldn't go in, and this should only go in for an internship or your first entry level job out of college. After your first job, there's no business to have your GPA, nobody cares. They care about your experience. Okay, so if you have a 3.0 or higher, cumulative GPA is all the courses you've taken here at GCC is your cumulative. Major GPA is anything you've taken just for your major prep to transfer. So whatever you got off of CIS, our transfer center webpage, those classes, like if you're a business major and you have to take accounting 101, 102, econ 101, 102, business law, stats, those are major prep classes. If you add those GPAs, you may put it in here because sometimes people's major GPA is higher than their cumulative and that's okay too as long as it's over a three. And you have to distinguish major GPA, cumulative, okay? Related coursework. This is a subheading under, and it should be bold in all caps, or I'm bolded, not all caps, but whatever style, under education. This is where you put what are these major courses that you want to talk about. You know, maybe you're on an accounting internship with me, and I want to know, have you taken managerial and financial accounting? That's what I want to see on there. So you always put the course name, not the title. Don't put Econ 102, because I'm like, as an employer, like, what the heck is that? I want to know it's macroeconomics. That's what I care about. Okay, so this is a good thing to have when you're trying to get your first internship or you're trying to do a job that you have the educational background for and you may not have any work experience for, that'll help you. Okay, so after your education will go experience. And these are, I'm gonna define what this experience, what this means. So you've got your work experience, your relevant experience, your leadership experience, your volunteer experience, research or project. Okay, so if you can separate it out, this is better for you. The more you can distinguish your resume into sections, the easier it is for an employer. The chance of you getting an interview is very high if it meets the needs of the employer. Work experience is anything that's part or full-time work. Okay, anything you're making extra money. You're working at Glendale Galleria, you're working at The Habit, you're working at Porto's, whatever. What are you get, working full or part-time, getting paid to do a job to do, okay? Relevant experience, and what distinguishes relevant from work is relevant experience is any experience you have whatsoever that's relevant to the internship. Anything you've done for free, anything you've done paid, doesn't have to be a work experience, could be a leadership, could be volunteer, any experience you have that's related to what you'd like to do for this company or organization goes under relevant because it shows them, oh, this person has, this experience is related to what I need. It's related to the type of work. Even though it's free, it doesn't matter it's free. It doesn't matter if it's paid. It matters that it's relevant. Leadership is any position that one has held in an organization, like I said, president, treasurer, vice president, student, senator, secretary, group coordinator, historian, all of the above. You want to separate if you have a leadership role because companies like leaders, not just followers. Followers good too sometimes, but it's nice to distinguish. If you take on extra responsibility, if you have that role, show it off. That's a good thing. Volunteer experience is anywhere you have volunteered, either weekly, monthly, you know, once a semester. And if, you don't, and if you'd like to get involved in volunteering and you have no idea how, and I highly recommend because it's really attractive to employers, they like to know that you're going to do something for another and serve your community. And so volunteerism and community service is a huge thing. It's not just what you did to graduate from high school. It's actually a big thing for your college applications for the four-year, and it's huge. I've had more employers tell me they like volunteer work because a lot of companies like Disney, Warner Brothers, they have volunteer programs. Once you get hired, you can be a part of within their organization to give back to the community because that's what they're really big on. So CSI, the Center for Student Involvement here, SM267, right next to the upstairs cafeteria, is a great place to, they have listings of hundreds of volunteer opportunities for you. A lot of our students volunteer on this campus. We've been recognized by the President of the United States for the quality and strength of our volunteer programs here at Glendale. Take advantage of it and do something. You don't have to do something every week. You could do something once a semester. You know, it feels good when you give of yourself. You get more back than you give. Project experience. This is more for, if any of you are engineering or science majors or business majors, you're probably gonna have this section. This is something we see more, and research experience as well. Research is more, you're a bio major, you're a chem major, you're an engineering major. They tend to have, because they have to work on class projects, they have to do projects in their internships. That are So this is, uh, you'll see a lot of this project and research, more for you know, engineering and business and science type resumes, not so much for you know, communication, English, psychology. Uh, you may do some research for psychology, depends on what kind of psychology degree you're looking at or what kind of 
are you doing like industrial psychology or social, psychosocial, depending on that. Okay, so once we get to the experience, this is how you're gonna list experience, because there's a format to this too. You're always gonna list the name of the company, organization, city, state, and dates, and the date should be when you start to when you finish, okay? And you wanna be consistent. So if you're gonna write out the word June, then you need to write out all the months throughout your resume. If you're gonna put 06, you need to write it in numbers to be consistent. It's all about the consistency. So the first line is gonna be the name of the organization, the city and the state, and the date you work. Now, if you're currently still working on the job, you say present. So if you started in September 2012 and you're still working, you're gonna put September 2012 dash present or current. That's the jargon that they use. If you ended the job, then you're gonna put the end date and use ED form of the verb, right? But if you're currently doing it, you're gonna do present. You wanna have the title, what do you do? Are you an intern? Are you, a, that goes in the next line. So the first line is the name of the company. Do not include, you don't need your boss's name, you don't need the address of the company, you don't need the zip, you don't need the phone number. You just need to know the name of the company, the city and the state it goes, and the dates, okay? And what is your job title? So here's the trick to writing experience section. You've got to bold either the company or your title. What is more important? For some people, working at a certain company is important. For, another, for other people, it's their job title. Being a manager is more important than the actual place. You have to distinguish. So the way to make it stand out in a resume, you either bold the company and italicize the position or you flip it around. You're either gonna italicize the company or bold the position. You can't bold both. The one that's the most important to you, and this is a personal, yes, sir? Yeah, consistent to, right. It's best to do that, right. It is best to be the consistency is to choose. And it depends on different people. You know, for me, having been in this business for a long time, where I work is not so much important, it's what I do. That's, for me, my bold is counselor, assistant, professor. Not so much I work at Glendale, not so much I worked at USC, Pasadena, not so much, it's more the actual job I do. But depending, for a college student, you know, maybe you had this awesome internship with, you know, one of the big financial firms in downtown LA, that, like Deloitte and Touche. Well, I would, inter I would highlight that more than being an intern because that's prestigious to get hired by them as an intern, so yeah. Excellent question though, okay? But you need to show a distinction between the company and your job, okay? And what you're gonna have is, you're gonna include, you know, resumes typically include jobs and internships during the last two to 10 years, except if you're in high school. Remember, once you leave GCC and you're a traditional college student, you cannot have that stuff in there. And that's why we're trying to get. Now when you, so after you put the name of the company and the title, okay, then you're gonna put bullets. And you're, here's where you're gonna tell us using verbs, what did you do for the company? Did you work with a team of five to develop some training manual? Did you increase sales by 10%? Are you the highest grossing customer service representative at Macy's? Numbers are important, okay? So you wanna look at your transferable skills. And transferable skills are any skill that you acquire in school, in a job, in an activity, even at home, any skill you acquire that you can use from one job to another. For example, you can be a leader in the classroom. You can be a leader at your part-time job. You can be a leader at your club and organization. Leadership is leadership and companies love leaders. And that's a skill that's transferable. You can be a leader at church. You can be a leader in multiple places. You can take the skill of being a leader, what it takes to be a leader and manage people and do that in every type of job because every job needs a leader. That's what a transferable skill is. That's what we're looking for. Okay? And don't use the paragraphs, as I said. And you want to describe what you did. So I tell people, when you're writing a resume, you want to write it as though the person reading has no idea what the job is, even though you're applying for a similar job. Okay? So let's say you've been interning in finance, and you're going for a full-time finance job, and you've had three internships in finance. You write the description of the internships as though I have no idea what finance is. And you have to, you can't say, you know, I see on a resume a lot of people will say, work with a team of five. And I'm like, to do what? Because you've got to answer the question in the sentence, work with a team of five, what? To increase sale capacity? 
to improve customer client relations. You can't just say you did this and leave it like this. Let a team of five work with a team of five, work with, you know, manage 10 different clients. What's the purpose of it? Because you've got to address for me. Because if I don't know what the purpose is, how do I know it's, it's worthwhile, right? Quantitate. Employers love, regardless of what you do for a living, regardless of what career you go into, what kind of job, they love numbers. Numbers drive business, and everything in life is run like a business, even nonprofit. So you want to use numbers. So did you work with a certain number of clients? Work with the, so maybe you're a host at a restaurant, and you're responsible for 10 different waiters and 20 different tables. List that. You're responsible to manage all that when you're on your shift. Percentages. So did you increase a certain number of percentage? Did you increase your clients, your, what you sold, um, incre you know, increase the amount of people opening up a checking account, a credit card? You know, one of my students works here, and he's like the top credit card person at Macy's here. He opens up more credit than anyone on the floor. And I said, then you need to put that because you're showing that you can increase numbers in sales and dollar amounts. So if you, you know, any type of dollar amount that you work with is really good. Employers love that, regardless of what you do. Whether it's in a volunteer situation, whether it's an internship, part-time job, it's all about the numbers, because the numbers mean something. Whether you're a business major or not, or a math major, or engineering, has nothing to do with it. It's about the numbers, because numbers justify results, and people are results driven. And as I said, transferable skills, any and all skills. So if you don't know what skills you have, you can come and make an appointment with us and we will do a brainstorming session. But you all have skills. You can make decisions, you can lead, you can manage, you can market, you can sell, right? You can create, you can develop. Those are all types of transferable skills. They're skills that we all have, that you can use in any and all job. The number one skill employers like is communication, written and verbal. It's the top skill across the board any employer will look for. And so they want to look at how do you prove communication? Do you work with clients? Do you work with customers? Do you provide excellent customer service? Are you a good listener? Are you able to troubleshoot? If they say, I need this from you, can you show me in your, in your, in your store where I can find it? Are you going to give me a hard time saying, I don't know? Or if I need to talk to your manager, are you going to take me to the manager? Because I need to resolve my issue. Or are you just going to be like, I don't know where he is. I can't help you. Well, why would I want to pay for that? I don't want to pay for that. I could do that myself. OK. Then, so, that, so you're going to have education and then whatever type of experiences you have. OK? So relevant, work, project, volunteer, whatever you're going to have. Then next goes skills. OK? So skills are all, any and all computer language and personal skills that you have that go with the job. So depending, this is where you tailor, depending on what the job is. So if the job description says, must be proficient in Microsoft Office, Excel, PowerPoint, Access, you should be proficient. It's got to be in there that you know how to use. And you're proficient, because that's the language they're using. You can use proficient. You can use knowledgeable. You can use expert. You know, those are different types of adjectives to describe your skill. Language is, do, are you conversational? Do you have basic language knowledge? Are you fluent? Can you read, write, and speak and communicate? And then the personal skills. So, you know, what, and this is based on the job, the personal skills. Yes? Sorry, That's okay. But, um, in terms of proficiency versus mm -hmm. familiarity, mm -hmm. in a class at GCC, you're taught, for example, Excel, Office, mm -hmm. Access. Mm -hmm. You don't usually use Access in everyday life. Right, right. But certain businesses want that. Mm -hmm. So, can you say that you're proficient in Office or Excel? Sure, as, as long as you're. Familiar? Well, familiar means I kind of just know it. Proficient is I can use it and know it, but I'm not an expert. Okay. So That's the distinguish between the language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would if I were you. Yeah. Because again, the job description dictates. Because the job description, it's all in the details. The devil's in the details. What they say is what goes. So if they say, okay, it must be a junior to apply for this internship, and if you're not a junior, you're not in the running. Wait till you're a junior. So it's, it's an employer-driven market, and it's going to be, because the recession has changed everything. I mean, there are more people with degrees, unemployed people running around, than there are actually jobs to fill them. And so even when the economy is going to get better, uh, the projection is, and I, I believe it will get better, it's looking, it's just slow, the recovery is slow, especially in California, because a lot of people live in California, and a lot of the market is here, you know, uh, but will get better. I mean, the economists say, here in this state, they say 2017, 2018, back to normal. I believe that's true. 
by the time you guys are out though, because you won't be out yet, right? You're gonna go do whatever here, and then you're gonna transfer out, and then you're gonna maybe go to grad school, and then maybe you're gonna work. So by that time, I think it definitely you know, should be. I think the United States will get back on track sooner than us, just because so much of the population lives, like you know, 40 million people out of 300 million people live in the state alone. And so it's a, it's a tax on the system itself, but not a bad thing. And then activities, you know, if you're a member only, you would list the activities you're involved in. Um, professional associations, I really encourage college students to join as a student. So whatever you want to do for a living, that gives you credibility. So if you want to be a psychologist one day, you can join the American Psychology Association as a student member, and it's often free or very minimal, and they would allow you to join. So you want to join associations that are linked to what you're going to be doing for your career because it gives you credibility and validity. Would you go to a doctor that isn't licensed by the American Medical Association? I wouldn't. I wouldn't chance it. Would I go to a lawyer who's not has the bar passed? No. So the same thing is that gives you credibility. And in the Iron Employer, it's highly rated because it means you have a commitment to our field and you want to be a active member in what's going on and you're up to date with what's going on. You know, when I interview counseling people who want to be counselors, I look at what associations are they belonging to. Do they know what's cutting edge, what's going on in our field, the changes coming down from Sacramento and Washington. They need to be, I said to him, are you going to work in Mississippi or something? I said, are you going to stay in California? Like, and I wasn't joking. I said, are you staying in California with that? And he said, yeah. I said, that's not going to get you anywhere here. That, having that is so discriminatory, so divisive, so slavery, so anti-everything that this day pretty much, I mean, I'm sure there are people who belong to that. And I know in the, in the South, there's still KKK still around, you know, Aryan Nation still around. But it's not acceptable, especially here in California, that's more free thinking, more accepting. And I said, if I were you, I wouldn't keep that in here because you're not going to get. Now, if you want to go work for the KKK, awesome. You know, go do that. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just telling you like it is. But those, there are certain things, you know, like if you're vegan, awesome, but some people may be pro meat. And you're going to see what happens is you're going to get into an interview committee or you're going to have people looking at this that are going to judge and evaluate you based on what you have. So you don't want to have things that are too controversial. Yes? What about the opposite thing, like Amnesty International? Oh, that's okay. That one I haven't had a, a problem with from what I've had students put that in, I haven't had, unless it's an organization that's, you know, but that I haven't had a problem. It's more what I've seen is a lot of the politics, a lot of the religious. Huh? It is. But yeah, I mean, unless you're going for a conservative think tank, that might not be the best. You know, if you have a Tea Party run thing, that might not be the most, you know, PC thing to do. Yes? Yeah, you said politics. So yeah. Say you have to be careful with the politics. Office. But yeah, if you're, let's say you want to go work for Governor Brown. Most likely, if you're a Democrat or a moderate, he probably, you know, if you say I'm a member of the Tea Party, I don't know how much he's going to be actually open to having you on board. No, like, and stuff. if you've already had that mm -hmm. as an internship, mm -hmm. would that be controversial? It depends what you're going to use. What I mean, I would want to look at the context of what it is. That's where you need the individual court counselor to look at it. And I'm going to ask you what you're going to do with it. And it depends what you're applying for and who you're applying for. Because some p things are very, you know, considered controversial. So, you know, some things are. And it depends in the state where you're applying. This state is more liberal. So liberal things are going to go well. But if I go to Alabama and you're going to say that you're, you know, a Democratic huh, fundraiser, huh, probably that's not going to fly too well. Is it what part? Too, um, general to say art, fashion, music. No, that's fine. Photography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are okay. I actually one thing nice about interest. I've had a lot of students who, like one of my students, put his passion was classic films and snowboarding, and it happened to be that one of the members of the committee was into that too. And they're like, "Oh, me too. Tell me." Like, if they're going to "Tell me, where do you snowboard?" It's that connection, and that connection is like it's a good connection. It's still a good connection because they remember, you. oh, that was the gentleman who had that, we had that great after conversation. Like sometimes an interview question they'll ask you is, tell me something about yourself that's not on your resume. And you may want to talk about something you're passionate about that's non-controversial. And someone on that panel, oh, me too. Maybe we'll see each other on the court, you know, at a golfing or whatever. So, okay. And then, you know, where do you look for a job, uh, you know, friends and family, internship job openings on company websites. Don't just rely on career, a lot of people just use career builder, LinkedIn, America's job bank. Those are nice, but they're not the best way to find a job. You really should, uh, you know, learn to use social media, attend the career fair. There was one today, job fair. Uh, volunteer is a great way to get your foot in the door. Create a LinkedIn profile. I'm really big on that. I do a whole 
a workshop on that with my classes on how to use LinkedIn to your best to your advantage. And then the reference, my last thing before I go. So remember how I said you're not going to put references available upon request in your resume? You're not going to put that terminology at all. Turn to page 17 in your resume guide. This is what you're going to create instead. You're going to create a reference sheet. And you're only going to give this when an employer asks for it. So if an employer doesn't ask for it right off the bat with the application, you hold on to it. Typically, employers tend to ask for the reference sheet during the interview process, usually after the first round. So if you make it to the second, they probably ask for your references. But you're going to get another sheet of, you're either going to do it as a separate attachment through an email, or you're going to get another sheet of resume paper. Okay? And you are going to, whatever style header you use on your resume, so two, three, four, five line, you're going to get another piece of paper or open up another Word document and, and cut and paste that header from your resume into another sheet. And you're going to put the word references in there. And then you're going to list three to five references. So the important thing with the references is they should be a combination of professional and personal, not your mom. Your mom's awesome. Or your brother and sister. Not a good reference, too close of a relationship. Your reference doesn't have to be your boss, contrary to popular belief. A lot of people think your boss has to be your reference. It does not. In the application, when they say, can I contact your boss? Yeah, you do have to say yes, but they don't necessarily usually contact your boss. Who they contact, this is the trick, is the reference sheet. So let's say your boss hired you, but you really don't work closely with them. You don't really, you know, they just sign your paycheck. But maybe your coworker knows you really well, what kind of work ethics you have. That's who you should use in the reference. You should use the people on your references who know you the best, can talk about you in the best light, know your character, know your work ethic, know what kind of commitment you have. Are you a self-starter? Do you finish what you start? You know, your professors, your counselors, your coworkers, your direct manager, someone who likes you. Don't use someone who doesn't like you because they won't say good things about you. Ask their permission first. The thing I hate the most is when I get a call from an employer and a student far removed from me uses me as a reference that I haven't talked to in five years. And I'm like, who? Like, and they didn't do the courtesy of letting me know, asking my permission. Trust me, I'm not the best reference because I'm going to say what I really think. And they're very difficult. You know, employers now, they ask some really hard questions. I mean, I've gotten asked questions that I think I'm being interviewed. The type of questions like, how would you rank this student? Are they in the top 10% of all the students you've worked with and why? And give me three adjectives that best describe them. I'm like, you know. So they really grill references now. They want to know more. So put people that you really trust, that have your back, that can attest to who you are and like you. That's a good thing. Okay? And you want to include, if you see the sample, the name of the person, any degrees they hold, the title, the company they work for or the school they work for, the address, the phone, the email. Here's where everything goes. Now, if you see on that sample, we give you blurbs. Um, the blurb is just because some students have asked us, can I tell my relationship? I actually don't like that. I don't really like to explain my relationship to the reference. You can ask me in an interview. But the sample has that because we've had students ask us, I, I'm very close to this person. I'd like to uh, share my relationship with an employer. That's up to you. It's something I don't use, but it's totally, that's why it has the examples of the italics verbiage. Right. Yes? Some companies say that if you list them as a reference, mm -hmm. when they get called mm -hmm. for a reference, right. they only give the dates that you were there. Yeah, it depends. I mean, I typically, I probably that. not. I don't think that's a good reference. I mean, you need to talk to a direct person. Typically, schools do that. So when you call a school to verify, like when a company calls a university to the only thing the university can disclose is the degree and the date you got it. They can't say anything about what your GPA was. They can only disclose that you have the minimum calls. Like here, we verify degree. So when we call the university where the person got the master's, the only thing the university can say is yes, they have it. They can't. Know. They can't. Yeah, they can't know that. Well, you just put it in your resume, but they wouldn't know. Yeah, they're not allowed to disclose that kind of stuff. They're only allowed to disclose that you have attained the degree and you have the diploma in hand. Yeah, they could, right, and they could. Yeah, and we do. We ask for transcripts and that's where we look at it. But we also ask for degree of verification as well because sometimes people forge things. We live in a society that's very easy to do things. Okay, and like I said, create a draft for yourself. The average person, regardless of age, 
about two to three drafts before they're ready to submit. So create a draft, come and see us. The pink sheet has our, uh, I don't make my own appointments, so you would call or come into the Career Center, San Rafael second floor, those are our hours of operation, and that is where you would make your appointment for the resume critique. Now, remember, we don't do any, the career count, we don't do any career counseling in the summer at all. So our last day is June 12th. When classes end, we stop as well. So if you need that resume sooner rather than later, you want to get in and get an appointment, okay? And just tell them you attended the workshop because we require you to attend one of the workshops we give, whether through our classes, through the Career Center, or through outside sources. Thank you for your time. You I hope it was helpful. And there should